I'm Pete Agnew, uh, and you're watching Heritage Musicians in Conversation with Joe Matera. And Joe has told me that I can kindly uh, do a bit of advertising here, because uh, we've got a new album out, um, which you may or may not have heard. It came out in April. It's called um, Surviving the Law, and it just so happens, just so happens, I've got a copy here, just to give you a quick swatch at this. This is uh, Surviving the Law. Can you see that? Uh, kind of thing. Mm, there you go. Nasa Survivor, that's a 25th album. And if you want to get a bit re retro, it's on cassette. I, I was going to supply you with pencils with this one as well, but there you go. Um, so Surviving the Law, new album. It's a 25th studio album. We're very proud of it. Great reviews, and I agree with them all. So there you go. Your uh, breakthrough album, um, Razam and Az, um, that came out just at the right time for the band because um, you, the management, were about to pull the plug on the uh, band. Pretty much, yeah. You know, I mean, would 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 well that would have happened as well with the um, it would have happened with the record companies as well because what you back in those days, what you you, you used to well, actually it was very kind. It was a better time than these days. You got you got like three albums to make your mark, you know, and if. And if you didn't do it by that time, then it was kind of goodbye from the record company. And if you'd had three albums with the record company and you hadn't done anything with them, there was nobody else sort of lining up to sign you up. You know, you know, you'd always, you know. So our first two albums were very much test albums. You know, they were. I mean, we we never really knew what we wanted to be at that time. You know, we we couldn't make up our mind if we wanted to be a rock band or the or you know uh, the Flying Burrito Brothers. You know, we 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 had sort of country stuff and all different things and so it was that one when we decided well we're a rock band you know so, so let's do it like that so yeah but that would have been that would have been the last one but to tell you the truth when when we when we wrote the stuff for Razum and us I mean it didn't you know it, it did not come as a, everybody said oh it must have been a great surprise you know whenever they not we knew that was going to be it because we knew the record you know every song on it would been would already played on the road for about six months before recording that we we played it when we were out in tour with Deep Purple and every even they were all going, What's that song? What's that? What's that song? So we knew we had a we knew we had a good one, you know, when when we got to that stage. So we were fairly relaxed when we went into the studio to record it. So it was uh, and it was a good one for us, obviously. Thank God for Razum and us. Um later on when you when you released um Love Hurts, the uh that gave you a massive hit. Now, um because of that, that actually a lot of journalists sort of started labeling you um or it, that, that Nazareth were actually one of the first bands to have a power ballad. Is that correct? Yeah, and I think I figured I figured Rob Hurts was the first really big rock ballad. I think that had that that the sort of aggressive ballad, if you like, almost, you know. But um yeah, 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 I think so. I think okay. I think so. And so we're, uh, again, you know, it was it was Love Hurts that because of Love Hurts being on the album. Uh, that's when people discovered the, the other rock stuff, you know. Now, now why was the um, why was uh, Love Hurts left off the UK pressing of the album? Well, it was never supposed to be on any uh, album. Um, what what we did was that the story of Love Hurts. I've told it many times, but it's a good one. Um, you know, back in those days, when when you released a single, they always would you know every single had a B side. So when when you had an album, the the record company would take. A B side of you know from your album, so your album was getting stripped. You know you had uh, two records come off the album every time you released a single. So you did two singles, you had four out records of your album. So that's about the time when bands started doing B sides, re recording B sides in the studio. You know to say, well, this this will go on. You know it won't go in the album. And of course, most of the time, what we used to do when we were well, eventually when we were doing albums, you went out to the pub. You know at the end of the session, got you know got ripped up. And say, right, let's go back and do a B side, you know. And you would go in and record two or three things when you were out your tree and and have a great time and put this thing together. You know what used to be funny about that? People would come up to you later and say, you know that one? That's my favourite record that I've ever, ever done. And you could hardly barely remember recording it, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but um, what happened with Love Hearts was, we it's a track that we would always loved. We, we used to listen to Emily Harris and. Uh, um, Graham Parsons, you know, doing it on the Grievous Angel album. And we used to play that in the van when you're travelling through the night, you know, your van tapes, if you like. And we always meant to cover it. So we were in the studio when we were doing Hair of the Dog and we said, let's, uh, 
Why no, let's do rough huts. We'll do that. So Dan and I went to a wedding. We came up to Scotland to a wedding and the guys were recording. So when we we come back the next day, Manny and Daryl had laid down a backing track, you know, just with the drums and the and the guitar. And and they said, Do you want to stick a bass on? And so I went, ah, okay. So I, I banged the bass down in 10 minutes. And then we were listening to it. And so it sounded good, good back track. And then we realized, well, they'd recorded it in the same key as Emily Harris and Graham Parson. We thought, hmm. So we, at first, we intended to do it like that, you know, with a harmony, like the Heatherleys, like them. So we went in and Dan went in to sing it. And it, just, it sounded like nothing, you know, you, with him singing it and me doing a harmony, it just sounded like, well, What's the point of this? You know, it just sounded like their version with a louder guitar. So we're going to scrap it. And Dan said, hang on a minute, let me let me try singing it on the octave. And we thought, well, good luck to you, pal. You know, because it's a, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah. So I was there the day he did it. I saw this being done. And he went in and he sung it. And we couldn't believe it. You know, when he when he actually sung it, and when especially when he did, you know, the middle eight part, when he sung that, I mean, that was like, I was only Alsatian dogs could hear that note, you know? Mm. So it was uh, amazing. And we thought, that's fabulous. So we did it. We're very pleased with it. And it was still going to be a B-side. So when we released the album throughout the rest of the world, it was released before it was released in America, uh, it had Guilty on the album. The, the, the song, you know, the Randy Newman song? Yeah. Yes, babe, I've been drinking that one. So we, we did the, a version of Guilty. And that was the, the slow track, if you like, on the album. And it got released with that everywhere. So when we went, took the album to a &M Records and Jerry Moss was listening to that and he let, he heard Love Hearts and he said, well, I'd like to take Guilty off the album and put Love Hearts on instead in America. So thank God for Jerry Moss. And um, and of course, the rest is history. You know, it's, 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 uh, you know from there on, it was uh, went mad. Yeah. But I was really on that, it was on that album by accident. And I mean... It's just, uh, which uh, I think it was so great because what happened after that was uh, you, it got played all over America. And of course, then the, the college stations and that, they picked up on Hair of the Dog, Son of a Bitch, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, that was what sort of started it all up for us in the States. And I think that made it kind of more international for the band, you know. Mm -hmm.